Sincerely seeking God. When we seek to know God, we should search for Him with all our hearts, knowing that He will ultimately respond. Here's Gene. When you read the uh, book of Jeremiah, it's primarily judgment. It's a word of uh, warning, of condemnation, of, of uh, it's not a positive message to Judah. But yet, he speaks of hope. And we see it here in chapter 29. A message of hope in the midst of all of this doom. For this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. And when he says this place, he's talking about the land of Israel. He's talking about Jerusalem and Judah. I will restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. These are the words of the Lord now to the people of Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. In other words, God is saying, yes, I'm going to judge you because of your sin, but I have a heart for you. And when you come to me with a heart of repentance, sincerity, I'll listen. And we see that happening. Now, here's the interesting thing. It didn't necessarily happen with a whole group of people. It actually happened with spiritual leaders within the setting, even in captivity, such as Nehemiah. And notice Nehemiah's prayer. Now, the little background here is that he had received a report that the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down, the gates had been burned with fire, and those who were still in the Jerusalem area, because there were some who were not taken into captivity, they were in desperate, desperate need. And so Jeremiah, being cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes there in Babylonian captivity, uh, was brokenhearted. And notice what he did. And I'm just going to read his prayer. And notice how it relates to what God said about hearing a prayer of repentance. When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great, awe-inspiring God who keeps His gracious covenant with those who love Him and keeps His commands. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants. The Israelites, I confess the sins we've committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the ends of the earth, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell." In other words, Nehemiah is illustrating exactly what God said would happen if Israel humbled themselves, bowed before the Lord, and sought the Lord with all their hearts. This is exactly what Nehemiah was doing for the people of Israel. Daniel did the same thing. In chapter 9 of Daniel, and I'm not going to read the whole of his prayer, but here basically is his prayer on his face before God, and he's in captivity. And notice Daniel's prayer. Daniel discovered this by reading Jeremiah's prophecies. It'd be 70 years, and it was coming to a conclusion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. The city is what? Jerusalem. And so here we have illustrations of men 
who were in captivity, but who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And they were in this condition because of the sins of their people, but they didn't buy into that. And while they were there, they actually prayed for the people of Israel. And that attitude, of course, spread uh, throughout uh, the Judah as these people began to pray for deliverance. Here's a, um, uh, an interesting statement, really, from uh, the New Testament. And I couldn't help but think of Jesus' statement on the Mount of Beatitudes when He was teaching His disciples. He said, keep asking. Now, I've called this persistent prayer. Keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep searching, and you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who searches finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Here we have a statement in the context of grace and God's mercy for deliverance, not just from persecution, but deliverance from judgment because of sin. If you call, if you ask, you will receive. And an interesting question for thought and discussion is, why do some people refuse to seek God's help even though they're experiencing difficult circumstances? And I had to think about that. Number one, I think, is ignorance. They don't know they have that freedom. They need to be taught. Another reason, I think, is embarrassment. We're ashamed. We look at our lives and we say, you know, I'm not going to be a Zedekiah in the midst of my sin, come and ask God to deliver me. And what we need to learn is that there's no sin that God won't forgive. We don't need to be embarrassed. The embarrassment has brought us to repentance. Therefore, we need to go to God regardless of our sin and our failure with a repentant heart. And another reason I think that people don't go to God and seek Him is because of pride. I don't need God. I can dig my way out of this by myself. And that, of course, is the ultimate in arrogance. Let's remember this wonderful principle. In the midst of all this judgment as a result of sin, when we seek to know God, we should search for Him with all our hearts, knowing that He will ultimately respond.